the joy of the Lord is our strength and the fullness of joy is found in his presence. When have we ever had more time to sit in his presence, soaking up the fullness of our strength? What's up, y'all? It's Rachel Elizabeth, and you're watching Real Talk with Rach, where we talk about real things because it's the real, honest, vulnerable, hard things that get us deeper in relationship with others and deeper in intimacy with God. We have to be honest about our circumstances with the people we love and first and foremost, most importantly, with God. God is real. Jesus is alive. We can have real daily relationship with the God of the universe because of what Jesus did on the cross. Jesus didn't just die for our salvation. He died for so much more. He died to give us new life, which is brand new identity as sons and daughters of God, saints in the kingdom of God, no longer sinners, but it's even more than that because when Jesus rose from the dead and ascended to heaven, it was after he promised his disciples that the Holy Spirit would come, which is the Spirit of God. And he would dwell inside of us instead of in a building or a tent like he did in the Old Testament. No, now we have free access to him because he lives in us. He testifies and points to Jesus. So he is the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Jesus that lives with us and within us. And he leads us, guides us, counsels us, teaches us, reveals Jesus to us. And when I say I've been living by faith, Spirit-led, what I'm really saying is I am in tune with the Holy Spirit and what he's doing in my life. It's as simple as that. Now that's looked pretty extreme in some cases, like my purposely homeless journey, trusting him with my every financial need. For example, I let y'all know that you can support me, but I never tell you what my current actual needs are. And most of the time, especially lately, I've had next to nothing in my bank account. And yet God has come through every single day with exactly what I need, sometimes a little more never less than I need. Those are a couple examples. And he's actually been moving on my heart to do something radical, something that I've wanted to do for a couple years now, but I haven't gotten the opportunity and I've asked for the opportunity, but I didn't see it coming this soon. Can't tell you what that is yet, but I'm sure I'll be able to by the end of the week. That said, I want you to know what the spirit of God looks like and feels like. Galatians 5 talks about living in freedom, freedom from the law, which the Old Testament was all about. The law was put in place as a parameter so people knew right from wrong. There's so much more, again, that I could go into there, but for time's sake, when Jesus came, he wrote a completely new law. And that law hinges on the fact that he took our place on the cross. He lived a perfect life, died the death we should have died, rose again, and ascended into heaven. And we, who are in him by faith, we're not only justified on the cross that day, but one died for all, meaning Jesus, and therefore all died. Colossians talks about his death being our death, which means in the spirit, our death was died on the cross that day. Imagine that even though you weren't there in time or space that you can remember or Instagram, in the spirit, you died on the cross with Jesus and you rose to new life and now you are seated in heavenly places with him, like Ephesians 2.6 says. You no longer live, but Christ lives in you if you believe. That means you're no longer a sinner, you're a saint. That means if you sin, not when, if you sin now, it's because you're still believing that your identity is sinner and not saint. Jesus says in John chapter 13 that we are clean. He washes our feet in humility to model what we're supposed to do to others. But he says we're clean. We don't need a shower. We just need to wash our feet. So stop believing that you're a sinner, stop sinning by faith and start believing that you're a saint and start walking like Jesus. Now I understand that there are bigger things at play in some sin patterns that have become addictions and strongholds that need to be broken, but Jesus does not see you as that anymore. You are still seen by God through the sacrifice of Jesus as pure, as clean, as a saint. So sinner is no longer your identity, but you are now a saint, a son, and a daughter of God as pure as Jesus. That is wild. So when Galatians talks about freedom, it also talks about walking by the Spirit. It says, when you walk by the Spirit, you do not any longer gratify the desires of the flesh. And it says those things are obvious. 
I'm sure any one of you could name a sin and it would fall into one of the categories listed in that chapter. We know these things. God wrote the law on our hearts, but then it tells us what the fruits of the Spirit are. When we are walking by the Spirit, by faith, when we are abiding in Jesus, these are the things that come from that. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. There's no law against these things. So how do we get these things? Fruit comes from a vine, and fruit doesn't make itself. Fruit hangs from a branch, branches that are attached to vines, and vines that are well tended by a good gardener naturally produce good fruit. My friends, Jesus says in John chapter 15 that he is the vine, that we are the branches, the branches that produce fruit, and God, the Father, is the gardener. The fruit of the Spirit will come naturally when we are abiding, living attached to our source, letting the gardener prune even the good branches, because pruning helps the branch produce even more fruit. The Bible says not to be surprised when we face trials, because trials produce perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope. And we have a hope in Jesus that does not disappoint. But it also says that God disciplines those he loves. He's a good father and a good gardener. But I want to go back to the word abiding. I have had trouble with this word for a long time, not because I don't know in my head what it means, but because it hadn't taken root in my heart as a revelation. I know that this chapter says that we need to abide in Jesus for these fruits to be naturally produced. I know that we're not supposed to strive to create our own fruit. I know these things, but I've been asking the Lord for a long time to move that revelation from my head to my heart. And thanks be to God for this quarantine because I've had the time to sit in his presence like I haven't in a long time. And during that time, intentionally turning my attention to him, sitting in his presence, reading his word, asking him for revelation, he's given that to me and he's given me more joy because in his presence is the fullness of joy. And because of that joy, I now have the strength I need to continue through this season, however long or however short it may last. So I'm sharing this with you so that you too can endure the season with joy Real, real, real joy, like laughing so hard your stomach aches joy. Doesn't always look like laughter, but why shouldn't it? We can laugh through all the memes, but true joy is what sparks belly laughs for absolutely no reason at all. Don't get me wrong, I am super grateful for memes. Hashtag levity. But let's get back to the revelation of abiding. So I'm gonna walk you through a little bit of the process I went through, not as a formula, but just so you have an idea of what I did with the Lord in his presence to understand what it means to truly abide in Jesus. Real quick, I have to say that John is probably one of my favorite books in the Bible. It displays the heart of God so vividly, but specifically, chapters 14 and 15 really get into what it means to abide and it starts off with Jesus saying remain in me a lot he says that a lot <laughs> and I'm like what on earth does it mean to remain in you I get it we're supposed to remain in you now tell me what it looks like to remain in you tell me how to remain in you so I'm going to read a big chunk of John chapter 15 real quick starting in verse 1 Jesus says I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. You can probably understand my confusion and frustration at this point, <laughs> but he goes on. I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not remain in me, he's like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be given to you. So we have one clue. He adds, if my words remain in you. So just keep that in mind. Picking back up at verse 8, he says, 
this is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. So when we bear fruit, it shows everyone around us that we're disciples or followers of Jesus. Verse 9, as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you will obey my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I've obeyed my Father's commands and remained in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. So if you didn't notice by the way I was reading it, verse 9 is the answer. Jesus says, as the Father has loved me, so I have loved you now remain in my love. And I ask, Holy Spirit, right now, would you give them the same revelation as you gave me in this very moment? In Jesus' name. Y'all, the same way God of all creation loves his son Jesus is the same way that Jesus loves us. And all he's asking us to do to remain in him is to remain in his love. You know what that means? That means all we have to do is remember his love for us. In the very next verse, it says, if you obey my commands, you will remain in my love. His only command is that we love one another. And the way that we do that is through the fruit that is produced in us and through us, made evident to everyone around us when we spend time with him remembering how much he loves us. We literally don't have to do anything but remember his love for us. John 3, 16, God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. That eternal life is now as much as it is not yet. Life, not death. Life to the full. Fullness of joy. Joy that's found in his presence. Joy that's made complete by remaining in the love of Jesus. Verse 10 says, if you obey my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have obeyed my father's commands and remained in his love. His Father's command was to be our sacrifice so that we could be made new, so that we could be adopted into the family of God. Be made redeemed sons and daughters of God, brothers and sisters with Jesus, heirs to the same inheritance Jesus has. That is mind-blowing, but there's more. Verse 11, I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. Wow. <laughs> Jesus has told us this incredible revelatory truth about the Father's love for him and his love for us and the simplicity of his one command to love so that his joy will be in us so that our joy would be made complete. Hebrews says, for the joy set before him, Jesus endured the cross. We our redeemed, adopted, new creation, identity, our presence in his kingdom, that was the joy set before him. And now we have the joy of understanding that we are his joy. What? I know it's not live, but leave me a comment if you are getting this revelation. Holy Spirit, please make it possible. And his command is just to love others the way he loved us which means laying your life down for your friends. And y'all, that sounds huge. It sounds like painful, sacrificial torture. But really, all of that, empowered by the presence of God, the Holy Spirit, becomes a joy when we are remaining in his love because it's a natural fruit that we're not producing on our own. All we have to do is turn to him and remember that he loves us. All you have to do is believe that Jesus is who he says he is, believe that he is alive, believe that he gives his spirit to those who believe in him, and remember, every time your mind starts to slip back into old patterns, take a second and remind yourself that that is no longer who you are because God loves you, because Jesus loved you so much that he died for you. All you have to do is remember that he loves you unconditionally. You just messed up? Take a second. Remember, he still loves you. Don't let the enemy lie to you about who you are or lie to you that you'll never get out of it. Take a second. Stop. Reject that thought and remember how much he loves you. Remember what he did for you. Remember that there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. 
Jesus took your punishment on the cross. He took your punishment so that you could forever stop in your tracks any moment of any day and get wrecked like I'm getting wrecked right this moment because he loves me. <laughs> and the joy of Jesus is in me. And you who believe have this too. You have complete access. All you have to do is remember, 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 remember. If you like this video, give it a thumbs up, subscribe to my channel, share it with a friend who needs it. If you'd like to support this ministry in any way, there are links in the description box below and links in my Instagram bio. I love you and I'm praying for you. Have a great week.